Hello, this is Zahir Alam. Welcome you all in Frankly Speaking. Our guest today is Frank Dobson, a veteran UK Labour MP and Secretary of State for Health under Tony Blair, a post Dobson held for more than two years from 1997 to 1999. He was an impressive health secretary at the time. He's a committed politician who gave up a well-paid, secure job in this electricity industry, initially becoming a Camden councillor and the leader of Camden Council in London. He became MP for Holborn and St. Pra uh, Pancras in May 1979 and was the official Labour Party candidate for mayoral post of London in 2000 uh, when uh, Ken Livingstone and Stephen Norris were the two other candidates at that election. Dobson uh, is an advocate to end of racism and corruption uh, across the world. As a seasoned politician, he is a frequent media commentator on health service. Uh, welcome, Mr. Frank Dobson, on Frankly you. Speaking. Good to be here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we're deeply privileged that uh, you are on our show today. Uh, Frank, uh, I know you know Bangladesh uh, for a long time, and uh, you have been visiting Bangladesh, and this is your third visit. But uh, uh, when first uh, you were aware about Bangladesh, uh, I know in 1971 you have a very big contribution and relations with Well, I, th I think I probably heard the word Bangladesh for the very first time uh, in February 1971 at the in start of the war, this month, okay. at the start of the war of liberation because there were uh, quite a lot of Bangladeshi people uh, living in the area where I lived which is where I now represent and I can remember going on marches and rallies and everybody shouting Joy Bangla and I was happy to do so and to support uh, Bengali people in the war of liberation and delighted when uh, Bangladesh uh, became independent. So I'm, I'm sort of equally happy to be here today uh, so shortly after such a brilliantly successful general election. I'm not talking about who wins and who loses elections, okay. that's nothing to do with me. Okay. But uh, I am most impressed by the way the electoral register was put together and the way the election was conducted. Indeed, the registration process, I think, is an example to the whole world. And uh, uh, we don't have as good an electoral register in Britain. And as everybody knows, they could have done with a decent system in Florida in the United States. Okay. And uh, maybe the United States can learn from Bangladesh. And it's about time people realize that uh, Bangladesh sets good examples of, and in, of certain in, in, things. In, in which area you do think that the Bang uh, United States also can learn from Bangladesh? Which are the areas? Well, I, I, I think that Bangladesh is trying desperately, the people of Bangladesh and the governments of Bangladesh have been trying desperately to raise prosperity, to, to uh, provide more equal prosperity okay. in the country. and. You know, Bangladesh's uh, contribution to international peacekeeping forces. Yes. So they, they are much more acceptable than American forces, for instance, in yeah. similar roles. So, again, Bangladesh is making a, a big contribution to the world now. Well, Frank, uh, what are the other tools, uh, or weapons, or means do you think most critical to be more prosperous? You know, Bangladesh has a lot of troubles and a lot of problems in many areas. So, what are the most critical things to be more successful? Well, in? I think one of Bangladesh's problems is that it's so susceptible to things happening in other places in the rest of the world. I mean, uh, people of Bangladesh eat rice. The price of rice is very important. And we saw this grotesque increase in the world price of rice when it practically trebled over a period of about 18 months or two years. But uh, it, it wasn't that people growing rice in Bangladesh, they weren't getting three times as much. It was the product of international speculators on the Chicago and London and Frankfurt and Paris uh, commodity exchanges and the, uh, Bangladesh is very vulnerable to that sort of thing and similarly with the ludicrous uh, increase in the, in the price of oil uh, it's a bit, it causes a bit of difficulty mm -hmm. in prosperous Western countries but it, it's absolutely desperately bad for uh, a, a country which isn't 
as wealthy, and particularly here in Bangladesh. So I, I think Bangladesh is vulnerable to these world trends and world exploitations. Similarly, of course, this is uh, you think, uh, or um, uh, in your view, is it traditionally vulnerable or under the given circumstances right now when the European countries or your countries also embarks or enters into the recessionary period? So, uh, uh, right now, is it uh, 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 we have become more vulnerable, or this is traditionally Bangladesh's position? Is and the, the, I don't think the banking crisis has had that much of an impact on Bangladesh but the general turn down in the world economy will be difficult. Oh, yes. Although I think uh, Bangladesh's garment exports, yes. because they're at the bottom end of the market. The remittances. Uh, 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 I but no, but I mean, the, the, the garment exports, I think, are probably okay, at least for the time being, because they're aiming for the bottom end of the <laughs> Western market. Yes. And people are in the West are sort of going down in their purchases. Uh, the danger, of course, is that some of the countries which have been aiming for the, the middle market in the West may try to compete with, uh, with Bangladesh. The other problem, as you say, is remittances, where uh, certainly uh, the problems in the Gulf, which are the, yeah. the principal source of remittances, the uh, reduction in construction work and things there yeah. will reduce remittances. The so flow. again, it's an example of Bangladesh is vulnerable to all sorts of things happening in the rest of the world. Uh, to which the problems Bangladesh have not contributed. Well, well yes, no. not, not, not one no jot way. has not Bangladesh contributed. But Frank, contributed uh, to as it. a health minister, you were the former health minister mm. of the United Kingdom. You worked under the then Prime Minister Tony mm. Blair and you have got so much experience about uh, revamping your health, health mm. sector. But uh, uh, what do you think uh, uh, about the least developed countries, developing countries uh, like Bangladesh, that uh, we have uh, 150 million people and most of the people are vulnerable, uh, uh, you said, uh, in terms of uh, economically and at the same time uh, uh, in their health service. So uh, how they, uh, uh, Bangladesh government can better serve the uh, people, the vulnerable people in health services? Well, I think the crucial thing anywhere in the world is to try to get the, the, f the lowest level, the primary health care working for everybody uh, rather than sort of concentrating on, uh, you know, uh, 10 very high-tech hospitals they, they may do a good job, but they will only serve a very small proportion of the population. But to have uh, access to qualified, particularly nursing staff, in, okay. uh, in, in the villages of Bangladesh is really, the, it seems to me, the way forward and seems to be what the, the government's policy is here. And I know it's also the policy of the World Health Organization, so I think there will be very substantial worldwide support for that because... For, for, for establishing or setting up a nursing institute especially? Well, you, you, you need more nurses okay. and as I understand it, you need better trained and better qualified nurses. Okay. This isn't criticising the nurses who are working at present. Uh, have, they're the product yeah, of the but system. But, but if, you know, it, it, one of the ways of judging uh, the, the prosperity of a country is what the level of uh, infant mortality is and, and the proportion of women who die in childbirth. Mm. And that, so those need to be two big targets to reduce those. Mm. And I think the availability of uh, qualified nurses in small community services is probably the, the best way of of improving the general but health do, of the people But do you think here? that the United, uh, United Kingdom, your country, uh, can extend their uh, uh, assistance or helping hand uh, uh, in uh, developing our health sector or health services especially? Yes, I think that uh, that's one of the things that Britain has got to do. I believe we are a little involved at the moment and I hope that we'll, we'll increase it and I will make it my business to when I get back to uh, sort of re-emphasize that to some of my colleagues who are in the cabinet to try to step up that aspect of, of Britain's contribution.
Well, uh, an, an, another thing is that UK-Bangladesh relations is uh, deeply rooted and uh, we have many common uh, values and things. Uh, uh, so, uh, at the present moment, uh, uh, you're representing some of the areas where the Bengali community uh, uh, is uh, uh, living over there. So, how Bangladesh and United Kingdom can better forge uh, understanding or relations and what are the possible areas to, 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 to building up that sort of relations? Well, I think for far too long in the, uh, uh, the impression of Bangladesh in Britain and uh, in Europe has been it's a place, it's a sort of problem, uh, you know, famines and floods yeah. and, uh, and negative all sorts images. of ne very yeah. negative I image. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, land of natural disasters, <laughs> yes, corruption. Right. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. But, and and it, the, the further we can get away from that, the better. Uh, but I think the relative stability at the moment and the, the quite outstanding success of the conduct of the last general election okay. uh, will help create a good impression. And, and things like the uh, introduction of uh, uh, the gas-powered uh, auto rickshaws instead okay. of the old uh, petrol and diesel engines which were pumping out all, all the filth into the air and such like. Those sort of examples lift but the uh, impression of Bangladesh, and I, I, I say to young Bangladeshi people in London, uh, don't think of Bangladesh as, as, as a sort of poverty-stricken place of, of difficulties and problems, because I say in the 18th century, those, those European colonialists, the British and the French and the Dutch, they didn't sail halfway around the world in leaky ships uh, because, and go to Bengal because Bengal was poor. They came because yeah. Bengal was rich. Was rich uh, yes. And what we've got to do is to try to help everyone uh, make the best of the resources that are available. You know, that more than a half a million Bangladesh is living in the United Kingdom and uh, they are somehow linked with restaurant business. They uh, earned uh, about, about five billion pounds annually in a rough estimate. This is a possible, this, uh, this was possible or this is uh, possible because restaurants made Bangladeshi cuisine very popular across, across the Great Britain mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know whether you love it or not. Uh, almost 11,000 restaurants are there. They badly need some workers. They are pleading, they are advocating, they yes. badly need some workers, I mean the specially skilled chefs. Yes. So as a MP uh, and uh, active MP and you have uh, got uh, influence with the uh, Labour administration. So uh, what our two governments uh, can do on that issue? Uh, can, can, you, can, can you? Well uh, the government have introduced a, a sort of uh, idea of having uh, quotas of skilled workers and the problem at the moment is they're, they've, they're not really defining chefs as skilled uh, and so together with other MPs I've been uh, urging the government and the Bengali Caterers Association and organisations like that urging the government to recognise that uh, these skills are necessary if the uh, restaurant trade is going to continue because one of the characteristics has been that uh, the the children of the restaurateurs, mm. a lot of them are not interested in being restaurateurs. They, they're getting a, a higher education, they're going to university, they're becoming lawyers and engineers yes, yeah. and things. And they're not, they're not going to be there to run the restaurants. So if, if the British want the restaurants and want good quality Bengali food, then we're going to have to get some more people yeah. uh, from, from Bangladesh. I, I, mean, I, I always say, it, it, it's, it's a remarkable thing that the Bangladeshi restaurateurs have achieved in Britain because if you say, what are the, how is a, a national culture made up? Well, you'd say probably first of all language and then possibly religion, but what people eat is a major part of a culture. Yeah. And Bangladeshi restaurateurs have changed our culture because uh, there is a huge amount of, of food eaten now, which yeah. no one in Britain would have dreamt of you? eating. What 50 about you, years Frank? Oh well, I, I eat a great deal, <laughs> eat a great deal of it, and try occasionally to make it as oh, well. Really? Really? Uh, so okay. I'm, I'm always delighted to do so. But I should emphasise now again. Uh, 
it's a bit like the image of Bangladesh. The image of the Bangladeshi community is that they're all restaurateurs, but now there are people with important jobs in our health service, in our schools. There are, there's a, I believe there's a Bangladeshi judge. Mm, uh, yeah, the barristers. Se senior barristers. Uh, Technologies. Pe people taking part, certainly with IT, mm -hmm. making a big contribution there. Uh, and so, 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 so you're pretty convinced, Frank, that the third and fourth generation Bangladeshi uh, British, uh, uh, they are uh, going to break the ice. Well, I think I think they've broken the ice. Already broken. Uh, but but maybe not many people have noticed that they've broken the ice. Oh, really? But I, I I think they're now making a, a big and very widespread contribution. My daughter-in-law, my Bangladeshi daughter-in-law, oh. is is a biology teacher. Oh, biology and, teacher. Uh, so uh, your son uh, married to Bangladeshi. Yeah, yeah. My, origin my, girl. Our youngest son is is married to uh, who someone who was Zushna Ahmed. Okay. And, uh, she's a lovely da daughter-in-law and has provided us with uh, Khalil and Jamal and Amila, three okay. lovely grandchildren. Okay. So did you visit uh, uh, your daughter-in-law's no, house? No, and no, no I, did, I didn't, because, partly because this trip was arranged in rather a rush. Uh, okay. And uh, so I didn't, okay. I didn't have time. The law and order situation is also a very crucial issue, maintaining in a capital city. Mm. What, what did you plan for London City at the time? I mean, there as a candidate. Well, but, uh, w one of the things I was suggesting was that uh, in London, people living in a particular area should be informed of the name of the, lo of the, the local police officers who serve that area and have ways of get better ways of getting in touch with them and reporting problems to them so that uh, catching problems before they get out of hand and making, making people feel secure. One of the problems to do with law and order and security is that not many people get robbed, not many people get beaten up, but for every person who gets robbed or beaten up, a thousand other people go in fear of being robbed or beaten up. And so the, the, there's a knock-on effect, a damage for everyone from the incidents that happen to uh, what fortunately is a small minority, and it's a small minority here, here in Bangladesh as well, who suffer as a result of crime. But everybody's concerned about the crime because they've heard about it happening to someone else or one of their neighbours or one of their family or one of their friends. Uh, Frank, um, uh, we need to uh, end our programme, but before we end, uh, uh, I'm very happy to know that uh, you have uh, had started working with Bangladesh uh, even before you became MP in the yes, British Parliament <laughs> uh, because you uh, became first uh, MP in 1979. But you started working with Bangladesh or for Bangladesh from 1971. What feeling you have got for Bangladeshi people and Bangladesh's image and Bangladesh's development, economic development? Well, as I say, I think Bangladesh's image is gradually improving now and I hope it will continue to improve. One thing I've always liked about Bangladeshi people in London, and I find it on the three occasions that I've been to Bangladesh, is that people have a, a very ready sense of humour. Really? And laugh at things, and uh, laugh at laugh at adversity, and and uh, that's a, a very welcome attribute. And people don't get all stuffy and serious, and uh, 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 very humane and uh, understanding uh, people. I, I find not everyone, of course, but yeah. most Bangladeshi people are very hospitable and kindly. And uh, if we if we all lived in a if we're all kindly and hospitable to everyone else, then the world's a lot better place and the chances of Bangladesh living in peace and prosperity are, are much increased. But the thing is, I don't think anymore it's not possible for people, comfortably off people in Europe and in North America, uh, we can't live in comfort and prosperity any longer with globalisation when other people are being impoverished and robbed. So we've all got to work together.
Thank you very much, uh, Frank Dobson. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy, and uh, it's uh, very good to hear about good words for, uh, uh, for about Bangladesh. And we wish, uh, we expect that you would visit Bangladesh uh, time and again. And we, the, uh, the the positive images you are trying to portray about Bangladesh, and we also uh, look forward and to bring about some changes about our image and our economic yeah. and social development. Uh, dear viewers, uh, we thank you indeed, and that's it for today. We invite you to watch our next episode. Until then, do take care. And bye-bye.